I have become really passionate about being the message, showing people that you can tactfully, collaboratively stand up for yourself and ask for more, even in a pandemic, even when you don't have all the power. And by doing that, it is not a selfish act, but quite the opposite. It makes room for the people sitting at the table after you. That's Alex Carter, director of the Mediation Clinic at Columbia Law School and author of the new book, Ask for More, 10 Questions to Negotiate Anything. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. We live in a world of overwhelming options, and whether you're an entrepreneur, an executive, or just someone who wants to make the most out of your time and money, committing to just one thing can feel impossible. That's called FOMO, and it's short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers how they make personal and professional decisions in a world of overwhelming choice. FOMO. FOMO. If you really want to see how effectively you can make decisions in real time, there's probably no better setting than a negotiation. When you negotiate, you must decide your objective, your strategy, and your fallback positions. And since this is a dynamic process, you must also be nimble, adjusting as you go so that ideally you come to an agreement. Of course, while you can plan for lots of scenarios, what happens once you actually start a negotiation can get messy. Fear, stress, uncertainty, FOMO, and FOBO can all undermine your ability to make decisions in the search for an acceptable solution. Whether it's a complex business deal or just something close to home like trying to get your kids to clean their rooms, we all engage in negotiations all the time. And that's why it's important to remember that we can get better at it. That's why I invited Alex Carter to show us how. Alex is the author of the new book, Ask for More, 10 Questions to Negotiate Anything. She's also a clinical law professor and the director of the Mediation Clinic at Columbia University, and she trains people at Fortune 500 companies and even the United Nations on how to be better negotiators. And it works. After our discussion, I took Alex's approach and used it in one of my own negotiations, and I doubled the offer I had on the table. Thanks, Alex. And then once we're better negotiators, stick around for the foam moment of the show. If there's one thing that's gotten us through this quarantine, it's been humor. And I invited an internet sensation whose viral videos personally kept me sane to come on the show. His name is Matt Bouchel, and he'll tell us how to create content that resonates without spending any money or leaving your apartment. And now on to the interview. But before we begin, I should note that Alex Carter was actually one year ahead of me in college, and I served with her in student government on the Financial Aid Committee, way back when I was a bright-eyed first-year student. But we really hadn't kept in touch since, so when her publisher sent me your book, I was so excited to have her on FOMO Sapiens and to reconnect. I also knew that I'd have to come clean on the fact that while I'm known as Patrick McGinnis today, that was not always the case. So I started the interview by asking Alex if she remembered what people used to call me back in college. Yeah, they called you Pat. Yeah, and 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 what do you remember about me in college? I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. You always struck me as such a like a happy positive person. I remember that your name was Allie. Now you go by <laughs> Alex. I was Pat, now I'm Patrick. So that's kind of funny that we changed our names. Um, but I also remember that you were very involved in student government. And student government at Georgetown, we all thought we were running the country. It was like sort of, we, we were megalomaniacal, I think is the correct word. Yeah. And so I remember thinking that you had tons of power. <laughs> oh my God. In fact, I think I thought I had tons of power. Uh, Patrick, okay, I'm getting used to that. <laughs> so I remember, in fact, you know, contemplating going abroad my junior year and saying to myself the words, I can't, my constituents need me. <laughs> <laughs> so I so I compromised and spent a summer in China. But it's amusing to look back and to, you know, to think of all the, you know, power we we felt we had. And you know, in fact, uh, we did. I mean, I recall that we got a few things accomplished while we were there. And that really set me off just knowing that when you have a group of people and you work together, you really can change things, even if you're even if you're young and you're a kid and, you know, you don't know any better. And it's perfect transition because now what you do is about using negotiation to leverage your power, I guess, would be a good way of putting that. And so you've written this book, Ask for More, which is all about negotiations. I was wondering as I read the book, sort of how you got into this line of work. So here I was, I was a second year student at Columbia Law School. And a friend of mine pulled me aside and said, hey, I just enrolled in this class. It's called the Mediation Clinic. Um, It involves a lot of talking. You'd be great at it. (laughs) And so pretty much just on the strength of that advice, I signed up for this class and I got trained in how to mediate, 
And I went down to this dingy, you know, jury room in a New York City court. And I sat in front of two people and helped them work out their dispute. And I swear at the end of that hour, it was as though I felt Morgan Freeman's voice coming down from above saying, Alex, this is it. This is what you were meant to do with the rest of your life. Um, Incredibly cool. And I spent then a few years trying to figure out what that would look like and how I could make that work. And so when I rejoined the faculty at Columbia running the class that I took as a student, it was just magical. I honestly wake up every day feeling like I'm doing what I was born to do. No FOMO there. I love it. Okay, so on this show, we talk a lot about decision making. And oftentimes, it's through the framework of FOMO and FOBO, which are Mm -hmm. fear of missing out, fear of a better option. You know all about them. So let's start with FOMO and negotiations. So I think about my own negotiations over the years in, 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 in everything from what you're gonna do on the weekend to major commercial deals. And one thing that I tend to see with myself and others is a desire to want everything. And I think that's a natural human tendency, right? So t- take me through how FOMO plays into negotiations and then what we can do to overcome it. First of all, the way I think about negotiation is different from what I was taught in law school and maybe what you were taught in business school and elsewhere. So I don't see it as just a transactional back and forth over money prior to closing a deal. To me, negotiation is about steering relationships. It's any conversation you have where you're steering that relationship. And of course, that includes the one you have with yourself. And so let me just say that avoiding FOMO, I think, you know, really starts with a look in the mirror. And sometimes, you know, I found that people, no matter how educated or intelligent they were, when they got into the room, they had what I called a negotiation one car accident. You know, they wanted everything and therefore they got nothing because they couldn't prioritize. And so I always teach that negotiation starts at home with you. And in fact, I think the key to good negotiation and the key to avoiding FOMO is picking the main problem you want to solve. I think a lot of times people get into negotiation and they feel like they need to start jumping right to solutions. And they're almost trying to, you know, throw all the spaghetti at the wall to see what's going to stick. I actually find that most of negotiation success is defining the right problem to solve. And that doesn't matter whether you're sitting down with a contractor to talk about a bathroom reno or you're thinking about something large like steering your career and approaching your CEO, your management right? To get that on course. So let's take an example here. Let's assume, for example, that you're negotiating your salary or your, or your, your new job sort of set up, you know, vacation and benefits and all that sort of stuff. And at that point, there's a real temptation to want to maximize everything. I want more vacation than anybody. I want the highest salary. I want this. I want that. How can you key into what you were just saying, figuring out, you know, what's most important to you, but at the same time, make sure that you're being balanced and getting a, a good package deal. All of the things you talked about, right, better salary, better vacation, all of that, those are what I call tangibles. And those are great. You know, it's great to go into negotiation and say, you know, I want a bunch of tangibles. Ultimately, as you well know, right, a lot of times we end up having to prioritize somewhat, right? We don't hit the Powerball and get everything, but we have to figure out sort of what's most important to us. But I want to back up even more because to me, The tangibles are not even enough of a picture. I think you also have to figure out the intangible needs you have that are driving you in that negotiation. For example, if I go in and I'm asking for a certain salary and I'm asking for certain benefits and all that, what's the purpose of that? Again, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? Is it just that I need to maintain a certain lifestyle and so I'm looking for a number of X to hit that? Or am I trying to do something deeper? Am I looking for a sense of advancement in my life? Am I looking to teach management how to value me in a way that, yes, involves money, but involves more than money, that involves my skill, my leadership, my experience? And so I'm communicating through that negotiation, not just I'd like to be valued at X, but I see myself in the C-suite someday, and I want you to start seeing it too. Again, I think... It is great to go in and to have all the tangibles you need. I would just challenge your listeners to link that up to something else. Take those tangibles, write them down, and ask yourself, what would happen if I achieved those? 
And that is how you connect some of those little pieces to a much larger puzzle that's going to drive you in this negotiation and beyond. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I hadn't thought about it that way, but it, you're sort of taking a step back and looking at the big picture and asking yourself, why am I doing this anyway? Which is, you know, when you think about FOMO, so much of FOMO is driven by perception and fear and worrying about the moment and not stepping back and saying, what do I really value? So that's a powerful way of rethinking negotiations, especially for those of us. Like I, I, I find negotiations stressful, right? And so let's, let's get into that. So fear, stress, you, you, everybody sits down at that table. And I remember when I was in business school, I would sit on the same side as the person I was negotiating with so that we be quote unquote, looking at the problem together, which, Mm -hmm. which I don't know if that has any value, but there's a lot of emotion tied up into these things. So how can you, as you, as you navigate, control your emotion, your stress so that you can make decisions in a fact-based way rather than an emotional way? That is actually a great move on your part. I don't think we realize how big a role the sort of the physicality and the space of our negotiation plays out in the emotions. In fact, as a mediator, you know what the best kind of table is to sit at? A round table, because we are then all literally on the same side. Hmm. And it's interesting because if you go into a lot of law schools, you won't find a single round table because that's a comment on how we view problem solving in our profession. Okay, let's go to the emotions. It's so interesting you you said that, you know, let's make a fact-based decision. And I think a lot of us feel that way, that facts are how we should be making decisions. But in fact, often it's emotions that help us make our decisions. So I sit down before every conversation and I ask myself what I'm feeling and I write it all down. Why? Because I find that the more I reckon with my anxiety, my fear, my anger, my frustration in advance, the more I'm able to then grapple with it and deal with it so it doesn't come rearing its ugly head during the negotiation, right? Like the monster at the end of the action movie. I also want people to look out for what I call the big two. These are two emotions that we usually feel or often feel in negotiation, but we don't want to admit it. We stuff them down, and then they come out really unhelpfully during the talk itself. And those two are fear and guilt. And so when you recognize those emotions and grapple with those before you get in the room, you're in such a better place to to have a more controlled negotiation. Okay, so now we've dealt with our emotions We've moved past that, but we have one problem left, which is that we're dealing with other people who are sitting on the other side of the table or hopefully at the round table or next to us, but they have emotions too. And I'm sure we've all been in negotiations where the other person uses their emotions, yells, screams, maybe um, tries to make you feel really bad, cries. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen in these conversations. So when the other person is coming at you with heavy emotions and potentially acting very irrationally, what can you do? Okay, great. I love talking about how you deal with um, irrational actors in negotiation. And for those of you who have kids in the home, right, you're used to dealing with irrational actors all day long. So the first thing I like to do when I get into a negotiation with somebody is to ask them what their goals are, right? Because then I can use that in a really powerful way. I always do that when I help people and coach them in negotiation. And then I've seen, Patrick, all sorts of unproductive behavior, okay? I mediate in the courts of New York. I've had people threaten to flip tables, threaten to taser each other, and all sorts of other things where there are words that I can't use on your podcast, okay? So when I get what what I call sort of an unhelpful suggestion, right? Like, I've got a suggestion for a solution. Why don't you blank, okay? (laughs) What I like to say is... um, So you've told me your goal today is X. How does that help us achieve our goal here today? Right? So you've told me um, that your goal is to settle this case. How does flipping the table help us today? Or how does tasering him help the person today? You know, I like to let people know that they do have agency, right? Ultimately, I may not be able to stop them from flipping the table, you know, I'm not their kindergarten teacher, and, and I can't stop them from using unhelpful language or unhelpful suggestions. But I can remind them about their goals and ask them how that's going to advance them. You know, another form of unproductive person 
might be somebody who's using a lot of emotion and they're acting like what I call a counter puncher. You know, the person who takes every single one of your ideas and says, no, 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 without so much as submitting one idea of their own. You know, I like to then really um, invite the person and say, okay, so um, tell me more about the no. And then I sit in silence and I wait for that person to productively contribute. Or I'll say, okay, your turn. I've submitted a bunch of ideas. You've told me that your goal here is to figure out a deal. So I'm now ready for your ideas. The other tool I like to use is I summarize what people have said. No matter how angry, no matter how ridiculous, if they say, you know, I'm, I'm so angry, I'm going to flip the table, I summarize that and I say, okay, so, um, so you've told us you're angry and you're going to flip the table here today, right? Or so you've told us um, that, in fact, you're not going to stick to the earlier offer you made. You're going to now um, double that demand to $6 million. Have I heard that right? Sometimes even just having their own words played back remind somebody to kind of recollect themselves and to move in a more productive direction. I would never want to negotiate against you. you <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have to say. Okay. I want to move on to FOBO because you sort of alluded to this, the no, 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 no person, but you know, FOBO is this unwillingness to settle either for ourselves or the other side. So let's take this from the first angle, which is, okay, I get the offer. It meets my needs, but I'm worried, oh, if I just hold out, you know, maybe it could be a little better. I don't want to take the first mm. offer. It's like, don't take the first offer. Maybe the first offer is perfectly fine. How do you think about that? Yeah, I think this is such a, you know, you really put your finger on such a powerful concept. And the way I view it as a negotiation specialist is what I call loss aversion, you know, because people are so afraid of losing. They are so afraid of losing that they will keep moving in an unproductive direction. You know, they will keep pouring endless amounts of money into a lawsuit, for example, that's not worth that much. They're costing themselves more by pursuing this course, and yet they do it because they're afraid of losing. So what I like to do is to reframe the situation to remind people about what they gain how they are winning. You know, I once, um, I was on a trip, a delegation of law professors to Israel, and one of the negotiators over there said, we will never figure out how to achieve peace unless we learn how to write the other side's victory speech. And sometimes what you have to do is you have to figure out how to make that person view something as a win something as a gain. Because the thing that I found, Patrick, is everybody has an audience to their negotiation. And that audience frequently is not in the room. It's the people that we're thinking about back at home. Who's watching me? You know, other people in my company, people in my industry, my family, you know, the other parents on the Facebook group. So I find that the more you can reframe things from a loss to a gain, here's all the time you're getting back. Here's the money you have saved. Here's now all of the effort that your company can put, not in depositions, but in innovation. That is how you help somebody write their victory speech and be able to kick that FOBO and move on. So you mentioned Israel, and and it's funny, as anybody who's been in the Middle East and gone to buy something at the souk knows that there's a haggling culture that <laughs> is, it's part of the society. In fact, if you don't haggle, you're looked at like, sort of, why are you here? And and your your experience, I, I read that you, you'd spent time in Brazil, and I know you've worked in other places, and so there is a cultural element to this. And so I'd love to hear from your experience, how these uh, strategies uh, can be applied in different places and what you've seen in terms of different negotiating styles across the world. The first place to start when you're working cross-culturally is to be able to have some self-awareness, you know, both about, you know, who you are, but also how you're coming across. And so that's what enables me, you know, if I'm teaching around the world, for example, the first time I taught in Japan, I became aware that I was speaking at my full New York volume and probably was, was blowing out the eardrums of the people around me. And so I brought that down. But then I would say the second part is really looking closely at what you're getting from your counterpart and trying to absorb sort of the rules of the game. The first time I ever haggled, you know, it wasn't a pleasant process. You're not used to it in the US. Although one of the things I teach Patrick is that much more is negotiable here than we think. But, 
you know, and I, all of a sudden I found myself saying, okay, right. So how about the good friend price or, um, you know, I, I'm, yes, I'm an American, but I'm not an investment banker. I'm just a professor. So what can you do for me here? And it's amazing how we both engaged in this process with a smile and a, you know, clap on the back. And everybody knew that we had just done, you know, what you're supposed to do, which is to work together to kind of come to a solution. So Alex, what do we do when we're in a negotiation and we don't have leverage and the other side has all the leverage? What is, how does power play into all of this? Power can come from a lot of different sources and sometimes some unexpected sources. You know, sometimes I've had people where it was an employer-employee relationship, for example, but the employee, you know, had either some powerful facts on their side or they were really capable self-advocates or it was a situation where the more powerful party really didn't want the dispute to become public. You know, so there were unexpected sources of leverage. One thing that I found really helpful in advising people in a negotiation where they're the less powerful party is when you're making your ask, make um, what's known as an I, we ask. What does that mean? It means you go in and you say, here's what I'm requesting and here's how we both benefit. In a way, you're no longer requesting, you're recruiting. You're trying to have that other person like you did in that negotiation back at HBS, you are putting them on the same side of the table. And that is often how you get results in those power differential situations. Was it always this easy for you? You clearly know what you're doing now, but have you always been just a natural? Sometimes I think people look at my background or they look at the title of the book and they think that I was born. You know, I just came out of the womb asking for more immediately. And you know, Patrick, that wasn't always the case. In fact, I suspect like a lot of young professionals or even like a lot of women out there, I found that initially I was much better at asking for other people than I was for myself. But then I had a moment. I went in to negotiate my first salary and I was totally nervous. I put on my power suit. I went in with a pad and pen and they came in above what I was expecting. So I kept my face neutral. I wrote it down. I said, thank you so much. I'll get back to you. And I walked out and I thought, what do I do? So I called a senior woman in the field and I said to her, I'm coming to you for advice. They came in above. What do I do? And she said, I'm going to tell you what to do, Alex. You're going to ask for more. And I said, I'm going to ask for more. And she said, yes, because when you teach other people how to value you, you teach them how to value all of us. So if you're not going to go in there and do it for yourself, then do it for the sisterhood. Do it for the women who are coming after you. And since that moment... I have become really passionate about being the message, showing people that you can tactfully, collaboratively stand up for yourself and ask for more, even in a pandemic, even when you don't have all the power. And by doing that, it is not a selfish act, but quite the opposite. It makes room for the people sitting at the table after you. What a great story. The name of the book is Ask for More, 10 Questions to Negotiate Anything, and you can follow Alex at alexcarterasks.com. Thanks for being here, Alex. Thanks. This has been great. FOMO. And now it's time for the FOMO moment of the show, and I'm joined by Matt Bouchelle, a comedian whose posts on Twitter and Instagram during quarantine have repeatedly gone viral. In fact, I saw one of these videos on Instagram, and I watched it six times. Then I watched a bunch of his other stuff, which is all taped on an iPhone in his apartment in Harlem, and it really cheered me up, and I think all of us could use that right now. Check him out under the handle at Matt Bouchelle. That's at M-A-T-T-B-O-O-S-H-E-L-L, and you'll see what I mean. And here's the thing. Now, while Matt's Twitter following is a respectable 37,000, one of his videos, a parody of corporate America's response to the pandemic, has surpassed 2 million views on Twitter alone. Let's listen to that post. It's called Brands Right Now. I think it's hilarious. And I love the fact that if you listen carefully, you can actually hear some sort of random clanking in the background. A shot of hope. A dash of faith, a can of Pepsi. We're all dealing with the burdens of stress and anxiety. It can make you want to pull your hair out. At Johnson & Johnson, our new strength revitalizing shampoo, the uncertainty of day-to-day life can take a toll on anyone. That's why Fruity Pebbles has teamed up with Red Cross. Over 2 million views. Wow. And that's not even Matt's most popular video. 
I wanted to figure out how he does what he does. So I started by asking Matt how he creates such popular content without leaving his apartment or even spending money. <laughs> it's it's funny because like you just have to be resourceful. You know, I don't anything you've seen me do is just on my uh, my phone. Like I, I shoot everything on my phone. I edit it on a free editor I found on the internet. And, and like you, you can if you have a good idea that's that's grounded in like a world that everyone knows and is relatable, I think that's kind of the key, really. I just get lucky sometimes with the ideas and getting them out there first, you know. What's the secret to making something go viral? Not just one time. You're not a one-hit wonder, but doing it over and over again. Um, I mean, <laughs> dude, I wish I knew. I wish I could give you like a formula. But in general, I find that the best stuff is the stuff that people are going to want to share with their friends. Like, I can make something that most people would look at and be like, oh, it's a funny video. But if it has that factor where someone is going to want to like send it to their friend and be like, yo, this is totally us. Or, yo, this is exactly you and me at the last year. Yeah, that's when people really start... Uh, you know, it, it explodes because everyone has some kind of story that they can relate to the video specifically or a memory about it. And is it is it more about having just a bunch of people sharing it to their small group of friends or is it all about having like a couple of big names, people who are influencers share your stuff? I think, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely a little bit of both. Like the, there's obviously like a, a huge bump when, when a big Twitter celebrity shares something. I'll, I'll notice, you know, a ton of notifications for the rest of the day if something like that happens. But I do find that like, like my best video was about uh, like trying to walk into an office conference room when someone else has it booked. And I think that one did so well because it was being shared by like students who do deal with that at the study hall. And like it was being shared by, you know, anyone in the workforce who works at like an office with shared spaces. So yeah, as much as like the big names can really boost your, you know, get your stuff out there. It's also very helpful to just do something for, you know, people like you and me, just regular people that live, you know, a pretty regular life. And so who, I'm curious of, of the sort of influencer names, people that you, when you, when you log into Twitter and you see that they've shared your stuff and, and sort of your jaw drops, who are those people? Very recently it was Chrissy Teigen retweeted one of my videos and that like exploded for a couple of days. Um, I know Jane Lynch shared one of my videos recently. It's just like, it's exciting, you know, cause you're like, oh, these are people I admire what they do. And, you know, They've got a good, uh, you know, career. So it's cool to be like, oh, they're saying what I'm doing is funny and valid, and it, it's reaffirming. Now you're trapped in your apartment making these videos for <laughs> who knows how long. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious if you're starting to see that this is actually having an impact, though, where you're getting opportunities from people who could, you know, give you your next stage of your career. Is this generating long-term value for you? Uh, you know, time will tell. Right now, it feels like, yeah, something's happening. I, I don't know. I, I do work with like an agent and uh, a manager. And I know that they've, you know, encouraged me to keep making things. And because of that, I've had some people reach out. And like when I did my my parody of the coronavirus commercials that everyone's doing, I did get a few like um, people that work in like post production that wanted to potentially use me for real voiceover opportunities. So um, you know, nothing that I can talk about right now, but I do think like I'll be getting more auditions because of just, you know, cranking out work. And it's so Matt, you've managed to create things that go viral that resonate with people. And a lot of people who are listening to this right now have businesses, they're creating content all the time and they're maybe not getting much out of that. You know, you write an article, you put an ad out there on Instagram and you get like four likes. And so what is your advice to people who want to create content that resonates, but also could potentially go viral? I try to make sure that everything I do is very real and like honest. I think, I think people, the issue people have is where they try too hard to make things that they think will be appealing where the reality is you just have to speak like a human when you're on social media, you have to like talk like you would talk to your friend or family member. You can't sound like a robot when you're trying to make things and wanting people to watch them. You have to sound like everyday people sound when they speak. Okay, so one last question for you. Fear of a better option is is, is a term we talk about a lot on the show. It's the idea that we are we are waiting for something better to come along and it can lead to paralysis because you're trying to make something. And I imagine when you make videos, you could spend all day perfecting it and editing it and thinking about it and rewriting. So how do you get past that sort of desire to keep on fiddling with a project and actually put it out there? That's why I like doing the little iPhone videos because it's a lot easier to be like, hey, you made a 40 second video. This is not your feature film that's going to go to the Oscars. You know, just launch it if it's 99% there and you will you'll probably be happy you did instead of like stressing over it. So it's like low risk projects. You can follow your gut a lot more easily. Totally, totally. All right. Matt Bichelle, thanks for coming by. Thank you so much, Patrick. 
FOMO. And that's the end of another episode. If you have an idea, a story, or a question, you can find me on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, and at www.patrickmcginnis.com, where you can also take the official FOMO Sapiens diagnostic and find out if you're a FOMO Sapiens. FOMO Sapiens is part of the HBR Presents Network. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrow. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it at Spotify and at iTunes. And as always, you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com. 